Hello everyone, good afternoon or good morning wherever you are. Welcome to this panel discussion reviewing the ADB's energy policy to meet the Paris goal of keeping temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. I'd like to give a warm welcome to our panelists, to Mr. Roger Fisher and to everyone joining live and watching the live stream on Facebook. And thanks to um, NGO Forum on ADB for setting up and organizing this event. My name's Sophie Richmond and I'm the coordinator of the Big Shift campaign, calling for the MDBs and other public finance institutions to shift funding out of fossil fuels and into sustainable renewable energy, ensuring energy, universal energy access. I've also been working closely with colleagues in the region and internationally as part of the Fossil Free ADB Coalition. I'll just give a brief overview of the plan for this session and how it will work um, and provide a short introduction to the Fossil Free ADB campaign before handing over to Mr. Roger Fisher to set the scene on the energy policy review and then to our panellists for their presentations. The first section of this panel event will focus on ADB investment in fossil fuels. We'll then provide an opportunity for E.D. Fisher to respond to these interventions before moving to a section on non-fossil fuel energy. E.D. Fisher will respond again before we open up to questions from the audience. Those in the registered event will see the Q&A box at the side of your screen where you can pose questions as well as liking them. Um, and if you like questions, that moves them up. Um, in the order of popularity and we'll try to get through the most popular questions, time permitting. Um, so to provide a short background on the Fossil Free ADB campaign, this came about um, as many civil society organisations and movements across the globe were aware that the ADB would be reviewing its energy policy this year. As we know, 2021 is a vital year for climate action and the Energy Policy Review provides an opportunity for the ADB to prove itself as a climate leader and to reverse its outdated energy policy and end its support for fossil fuels. We wanted to work together to demonstrate the desire from civil society for investors to shift and to pressure the ADB to stop fueling the climate crisis. The coalition is calling for the bank to end its financing for fossil fuels and to rapidly scale up investments for renewable energy. It's critical the ADB supports countries in leapfrogging to clean energy. It's important to highlight as well that the call to an end to all fossil fuel finance includes financing for gas. The ADB's current finance for gas, um, roughly $4.7 billion since the Paris Agreement, is undermining its climate commitments. Gas is not necessary in the energy transition and cannot be considered a bridging fuel when such invest investments will result in stranded assets and decades of locked in emissions and does not make sense climatically or economically when energy is cleaner and cheaper. Recent decisions by the EU, the UK, the US administration to stop overseas finance for fossil fuels is building momentum for the shift out of fossil fuels to take place. And as Alok Sharma highlighted in the AD event, event yesterday, the tide is turning for cleaner, cheaper power and the ADB and the other MDBs have an important role to play in ending all direct and indirect support for fossil fuels. There's growing recognition that investments in coal, oil and gas have no place in a climate emergency or as part of a sustainable green recovery. So I'm really pleased we have many great panellists from the region to talk about different aspects of the ADB energy policy today. Um, so before we pass over to the panellists, I'm very grateful to Executive Director Roger Fisher for joining us in this session today. Roger Fisher is the Executive Director for Austria, Germany, Luxembourg, Turkey and the UK at the Asian Development Bank. I'd like to invite him to provide an opening statement for this session to introduce more about the energy policy review and the role of ADB management and the board of directors in this process. Over to you. Colleagues, it is my pleasure today to join you for, for this uh, interesting 
uh, discussion and, and dialogue. And uh, my plan really is today to listen to you. So I won't say very much. I will be answering your questions, but uh, my plan is really to listen. And the reason is that uh, ADB is not perfect. We know that. But we are trying to improve uh, every day. And one way to do that is really to listen to you. Uh, so we know your concerns, you know what we don't know, uh, and we remain in dialogue uh, so uh, we uh, can help each other to do the right thing. I think it makes sense uh, to start off uh, with uh, reiterating the urgency of climate change and uh, mitigation and ad adaptation and all the other things connected to that. Some of us um, may have watched uh, the climate panel yesterday, and I think more and more people really understand uh, that inaction is not an option. And uh, I always, personally, I always go back to uh, the regular reports of IPCC. The main message I draw from those reports is time is running out. Time is running out, we do need action, improved action on climate now. Um, and that's where the energy policy comes in. Um, IEG, our independent uh, evaluation uh, division has shown us and has made a very convincing case that our current energy policy is outdated on many counts. And that's one of many reasons to, to revise this, this energy policy. As you now know, ADB is right now engaged in a number of uh, consultation processes uh, to put together the elements we need uh, to decide uh, on a new energy policy. And you can be sure that the board of directors is really part of this, this debate. I understand civil society is uh, part of this debate as well. Uh, I suspect that uh, my constituency, the countries I represent, Austria, Germany, Luxembourg, Turkey, and the United Kingdom, are somewhat close uh, to, to your positions. Maybe not identical, but, uh, but close. But um, I think it also is important to remind ourselves of my, my role. I'm only one of 12 executive directors at the, the ADB board. I rep represent, with these five shareholders, just over 7% of the voting share. That means uh, if we want a good energy policy, we need a collective decision. And you can be sure, I can guarantee you, that I remain in close dialogue with my colleagues about climate issues, about the energy policy, and uh, you can imagine about a range of, of other issues. But eventually, um, the, the idea is to, to gather major, majority. Um, and uh, multilateral means, uh, you have uh, countries from different standpoints, different perspectives coming together, trying to, to get a good, good solution. And that's what we're trying in, in the board. The president, uh, Massa yesterday announced that our goal is uh, to decide upon our new energy policy uh, in time before COP26. Uh, and uh, I will do everything in my power to, to make that possible and have that, that along. Um, two final points. Um, I think one of the background issues when we are talking about uh, ADP's energy policy is really uh, the question or different notions of uh, ADP's role in Asia's energy sector. Everyone knows it's, it's a very large sector and uh, ADP's means are, are just limited. So I think uh, there are two notional ways of looking at um, ADB's uh, role in the energy sector. You can look at ADB as um, just um, an actor who provides incremental fixes project by project. You can say ADB is or should be a leader 
in the sector, or you can say ADB should be a strategic, at least a strategic advisor uh, to its DMCs. And depending on on the, these choices, I think um, ADB uh, will have more or less leverage. Uh, final point: uh, I'm an, a very interested follower of your uh, fossil-free ADB campaign, and one thing that really strikes me is what you are demanding uh, really goes way beyond the energy policy. So I think uh, we need to expand this dialogue uh, beyond this single process and not expect uh, the energy policy to give every answer to every question you, you pose, because there are other sectors where we need Paris alignment as well. I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and thanks for setting the scene about the energy policy review and we're really happy to have you here listening and discussing with us today and I'm sure this is a discussion that can continue. Um, now let's go to our first panellist to speak. Um, Glenn Yamata is the energy campaigner with the NGO Forum on ADB. He's been a climate justice and energy campaigner for the past seven years. His previous work has, including, has included campaigning as part of No Burn Filipinas as an anti-incineration an anti programme and leading key lawsuits, including the first climate change lawsuit against the International Finance Corp Corporation in the Philippines. Glenn, please set the scene for us on what the new ADB energy policy should look like. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Good afternoon, Executive Director Fisher, fellow speakers in the panel, and to all virtual audience of this session. In setting the tone of this session, I'd like to share you our evaluation of ADB's energy policy over the last 10 years, using ADB's, ADB's Strategy 2030 as analytical framework. As ADB puts it, Strategy 2030 sets the course of the bank to respond effectively to the region's changing needs under which ADB will sustain its effort to eradicate extreme poverty and extend its vision to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. ADB's claim is that its aspirations are aligned with major global commitments. We believe Paris Agreement is one. To concretize the bank's commitments and how they progress, we have here outlined ADB's seven key operational priorities and cross-check them with the realities on the ground based on factual circumstances and experiences of our communities living in areas where ADB-funded energy projects are, and to them, they call it now, the sites of struggles. Addressing remaining poverty and reducing equalities is the first. For the last 10 years, ADB's top recipients of ADB's financing, like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, remained in the medium category, barely demonstrating increase in human development index from what they have back in 2009. In the area of social inclusion, again, ADB's top borrowers were able to get social inclusion average score of only 3.5, according to the World Bank CPIA policies for social inclusion slash equity cluster average. This score lies within the low and middle income category. What is alarming is that Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka's social inclusion score is on downward trend. This beside the fact that hundreds of millions are still in extreme poverty in Asia. Number two, accelerating progress in gender equality. Please take note that the three lowest ranking countries in the index are Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. Gender parity in terms of economic participation and opportunity is also below global average of 0.58 for countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and that is according to the World Economic Forum Global Center Gap Report in 2020. Number three, tackling climate change, building climate and disaster resilience, and enhancing envi environmental sustainability. From what we gathered, the largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world is Asia Pacific, where there was 17.27 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide emitted in 2019. In 2009, only 13.2 billion metric tons of CO2 was recorded. We also noticed the use of ADB's climate change fund in coal-based energy projects, like in the case of Changin Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle Project. Also, 
the 1,000 megawatt cir circulating fluidized bed technology in Mungdung Thermal Power Plant in Vietnam, as well as the Bangladesh Power System Enhanced and Efficiency Improvement Project, were intended for environmentally sustainable growth and inclusive economic growth. Number four, making cities more livable. ADB's provision of sovereignty can only attract overconsumption and overextraction of resources due to end-of-life approach to waste management. Further, the massive amount of coal used to run power plants in Asia has also made our city's living condition worse compared to other regions. The cases in point are ADB's pushing countries to establish WT plants, as well as the ADB's big ticket projects on coal, like Mundra Ultra Mega Power Project in India, the Visayas Space Load in Naga, Masinuk Coal Power, power Plant in Zambales. We also took note of the Ulan Batar project in Mongolia that is causing numerous problems to families already partially affected by the resettlement and land acquisition for this infrastructure project. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, the thermal project in communities at high risk. An example is the recent incident in North Sumatra that claimed five innocent lives. Number five. The energy benefits of dams no longer outweigh the social and environmental costs that damming up rivers bring. They disrupt the natural ecology of rivers, damage forests and biodiversity, release large amounts of greenhouse gases, as well as displace thousands of people while disrupting food systems, water quality and agriculture. To give emphasis, the power generated doesn't go to the places bearing the ecological burdens. A report alleges that Tanahu Hydropower Project in Bangladesh has and will cause direct and material harm to ancestral land, livelihoods, and traditional practices. This represents similar situations in other sites of large hydro projects of the ADB in Mekong region and elsewhere. Number six, strengthening governance and institutional capacity. We saw wasteful, inappropriate, and untransparent spending of funds from ADB by our governments. The Mongolia project is just one in the Kubsbul Lake National Project. It's just an example. We can add more. Number seven, fostering regional cooperation integration. ADB support for regional energy integration schemes have created differing views of local communities and countries because of lack of meaningful consultation, forced displacement, unfulfilled compensation scheme and environmental destruction associated with this investment. Among these are projects like Nangyep Hydropower Dam in Mekong region, the, Turkmen the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline in Central Asia, the Trans Borneo Power Grid in Malaysia, and the Ruksha Combined Cycle Plant in Bangladesh, as well as other power sector projects in South Asia. Beyond the impacts of local communities and environment, this project effectively undermined global efforts to limit climate change heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. With this at the background, the ADB is coming out with its new energy policy that will guide the bank in defining its energy portfolio over the next 10 years or so. But the big question has come to fore. Given the ADB's fossil-laden legacy, can the bank show real climate leadership by decarbonizing its lending and investment strategy and withdraw all of its investment in fossil-based projects? Will ADB hold itself accountable for all the climate impacts and tragedies that destroyed our communities in Asia? That will be all. Thank you. Thanks very much, Glenn, um, for illustrating the links between the energy policy and the ADB strategy 2030. Um, and highlighting for us the impact energy decisions have on livelihoods and the environment. Um, I'd now like to invite Avril de Torres um, to speak. Avril's the Head of Research Policy and Law Programme of the Centre for Energy, Ecology and Development, SEED, where she leads research and policy and manages strategic legal interventions. Seed authored the paper, Leaving Behind the ADB's Dirty Energy Legacy, which was published by the NGO Forum on ADB. Avril's going to speak today on ADB's energy footprint, highlighting ADB's impact on the energy mix in the Philippines. Please go ahead, Avril. Thank you, Sophie. 
Good day, Director Fisher. Good day to everyone. We're glad to have this opportunity to share our critique of the 2009 energy policy, as well as recommendations for the new policy. What I'll be sharing specifically are some of the highlights of the study that was mentioned by Sophie earlier, leaving behind ADB's dirty energy legacy. Next slide, please. Over a decade ago, there were varied reception when the 2009 energy policy was adopted. Some lauded the bank for heeding the strong call for a stricter prohibition on coal mining. Others criticized the bank for its double talk. This, of course, refers to the bank's recognition of the threat of climate change while still making exceptions for funding specific coal technologies and other fossil fuels. Next slide, please. Today, as the bank reviews its energy policy, we want to emphasize how the ADB has set a clean energy agenda in its 2009 policy, but still have a dirty energy legacy a decade later. Next slide. Because the bank's 2009 energy policy still allowed fossil fuel financing, its funding for renewable energy did not fully displace funding for coal and other fossil fuels. Next slide, please. In our study, we looked into all of the power generation projects of ADB since the 2009 energy policy was adopted until 2018. We okay. measured these projects in terms of installed capacity, since capacity helps us determine the power generated by these projects, their greenhouse gas and other harmful emissions, their overall impact and other important factors. Data revealed that in terms of installed capacity, fossil fuels actually comprise half of all EDB funded energy generation projects in the past decade. As we can see here, coal comprises 10%, while fossil gas even bigger at 40%. Next slide, please. The bank also provided technical assistance for coal projects. In its completion report for the 2014 coal to liquid project for a combined heat and power plant in Mongolia, it reported that it recommended new laws and regulations that would remove barriers and encourage more investments in this type of coal project. So the bank was simultaneously meeting its clean energy investments targets while also contributing to creating the myth of clean coal and providing a crutch for the next generation of coal technology in Asia. Next slide, please. And this is ADB's dirty energy legacy in China, the Philippines, Vietnam, next slide, Pakistan and Mongolia. Next slide, please. Today, the imperative to decarbonize is clear. Even Director Fisher mentioned earlier the urgency of responding to climate change. Next slide. Learning from its previous energy policy and its role in coal expansion in Asia, we now challenge the bank to adopt four main recommendations in its new energy policy. For the first recommendation, next slide, please. Do not just set a clean or a climate agenda, but rather strictly align with a 1.5 degree Celsius Paris goal. We emphasize the 1.5 goal because science is clear that a 0.5 degree Celsius difference can prevent millions of people from falling into poverty and suffering from climate impacts, especially in climate vulnerable DMCs like the Philippines. We urge the bank to choose a pathway without false solutions, such as carbon capture storage and energy efficient fossil fuel technologies. We are concerned that in Chief Yongping Zai's Q&A on the new energy policy, he once again mentions these false solutions as a way of supporting DMCs to reduce their dependence on coal. As we've seen in the past decade, CCS and efficient fossil fuel technologies have not displaced, but rather have justified more room for coal and other fossil fuels. Next slide, please. Our recommendations also include um, updating country partnership strategies to also align with a 1.5 goal and not just with the country's NEC, we want to highlight this in view of the fact that for some countries like the Philippines, NDCs are still not Paris aligned. Next slide. 
second recommendation is decarbonize the energy supply by ending fossil fuel finance. ADB should once and for all declare a full commitment to stop new investments and to divest from existing investments in fossil fuel power generation projects, related infrastructures, and projects across the supply chain. Decarbonization should also include ending indirect support through advisory services, technical assistance, or financial intermediaries. Next slide. Chief Yongping Zai in his Q&A said that ADB will make sure that gas projects are consistent with the country's NDC and long-term energy transition plan, implying that ADB will still fund fossil gas projects. We call on ADB to end fossil gas finance. In generation projects alone, fossil gas already accounts for the biggest capacity share in ADB-funded projects in the past decade. The bank also has to consider that there are countries that may not have a fossil gas phase-out plan like the Philippines. Next slide. In the Philippines, our Department of Energy dreams of making the country the Southeast Asian LNG hub and adding 18 gigawatts of fossil gas generation projects by 2040 under a clean energy scenario. Our Congress is also deliberating bills to develop the midstream and downstream gas industries without an exit strategy. So without a strict policy ending fossil gas finance, ADB, just like it did, it did with coal, may open the gateway for fossil gas in Asia. Next slide. Decarbonization should also prioritize just transition to protect affected workers, especially in the middle of this pandemic. Next slide, please. We also urge ADB to promote community microgrids. Um, community microgrids takes the concept of prosumer further by empowering communities to purchase and manage their own affordable distributed renewable energy systems. These projects are bankable when aggregated and they maximize energy access. Next slide. Finally, we recommend that the bank prioritize innovative renewable energy technologies and enabling infrastructures such as the urgent upgrading of existing grids. The bank should consider that whatever finances and support it provides for fossil fuels, regardless of the exclusion criteria in place, are finances and support that could have gone into renewable energy projects, especially in this critical decade of the climate race. Next slide. We hope the bank considers the, these recommendations in earnest so that it can finally leave behind its dirty energy legacy and not repeat its mistakes in the, best, in the past decade. Next slide, please, and I will end here. We invite everyone to read our study available in SEED and NGO Forum's websites. We look forward to continuously engaging the bank in its energy policy review. Thank you. Thanks very much, Avril, um, for your detail on the ADB's energy legacy and also providing us with really clear, detailed recommendations on what should and shouldn't be included in ADB's new energy policy. Um, for the last speaker of this section of the panel, I'd like to invite Hassan Mahedi to speak. Hassan Mahedi is a human rights and environmental activist working as the chief executive of CLEAN, Coastal Livelihood and Environmental Action Network in Kona, Bangladesh. He's also the member secretary of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt, a civil society platform work working on me the mega projects financed by bilateral and multilateral financial institutions. Today, he's going to focus on ADB's investments in gas in Bangladesh and the impacts on climate and energy. So, Mahedi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Safi. Mm, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Executive Director uh, Mr. Fisher, and uh, thank you, Glenn and Avril, for uh, setting the base of the discussion. I'm very happy that you already covered a, a lot of things, which I, uh, which is also my points. So um, it's easy, easy to me for me to uh, focus on, uh, especially on Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, uh, everybody, you know that uh, Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries due to the adverse impact of climate change. Uh, and now think about a farmer. Uh, who contributes uh, the farmers?
contributes around 48% of total workforce of the country, and 84% uh, of them are really uh, marginal and small farmers uh, who has less than 2.1 uh, acres of land. So they used to get electricity at a rate of uh, 4.5 cents per unit in 2010, which reached 8.6 cents in 2020. A farmer can't afford this electricity even if the coverage reaches 100% in the country. Electricity price increased 200% in last 10 years. But why this price surge? Three major causes are behind it. One is overcapacity. Second is fossil fuel addiction. And third is dependency on the private sector. It contributes to the price surge. So I should explain a little how uh, the country has come to this point. In 2019, the total installed capacity of the country was 19,651 megawatt. The overcapacity was 54.4%. In 2020, over capacity is 60%. If we consider the power plant in the pipeline, so total cap installed capacity will reach 35,635 megawatt in 2025. That means the over capacity will reach 104% of the demand. The over capacity forced the country to pay capacity charge. Since uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2010, the, uh, the government had to pay $7.93 billion as uh, capacity charge of the idle power plants. The capacity charge reached $1.3 billion in 2020, which will you know, reach $2 billion in 2025. So fossil fuel addiction. Total uh, capacity of uh, uh, 20,000 megawatt, around 20,000 20, 20, megawatt, uh, it's now, 57% of electricity are uh, generating from the uh, gas sector, then uh, around 35% from the um, ACFO and ACSD, and rest of them are coal and uh, renewables. So renewables provide on, provides only 4.3% of total energy mix. And private sector. Currently, the public sector is generating 53% of total electricity requirement, where 42% are coming from uh, private sector. Excessive price of electricity purchased from the private sector and capacity charge for the idle power plants are major uh, causes of, of the uh, price upsize. For the, these three causes, the Bangladesh government has to pay huge capacity charge every year. And now I sh we should see that what is the role of ADB there. So it, since 1973, ADB has invested 28.56 billion dollars in Bangladesh and energy sector got highest uh, investment uh, uh, which is 23% and the amount is around 6.5 billion dollar and including those now Rupsha 880 megawatt LNG power plant in public sector and 750 megawatt Reliance Meghnaghat power plant uh, is under construction here and the 54% of total energy investment of ADB has gone to the to build fossil fuel power plants, while only 1.9% uh, for the renewables. Uh, in the last 10 years, ADB has investment for 9,470 megawatt of fossil fuel power plants in Bangladesh, including 1,630 megawatt expensive LNG-based power plants. So ADB has recently moved to LNG from uh, uh, from the domestic fossil gas, uh, which is same, um, which has same emission like domestic fossil gas, and uh, ADB has also invested in transmission and distribution lines, uh, which is fit for only fossil fuel power plants, not a smart grid which which can uh, adopt the renewables. It is also financing the transmission lines to connect the coal power plants. So privatization has started in. 1997 by the by a technical assistance fund uh, from ADB 
and it it also gave money to summit group and united group to start first private sector uh, small power plant in bangladesh and secondly again in uh, 2001 adb has given another technical assistance for large scale private sector power plant for long term and it has also uh, uh, it also gave 140 million to uh, aes international a us based uh, company to establish a 450 megawatt power plant so this excessive uh, rate of uh, power uh, forced bangladesh to pay a huge amount almost uh, 3% of its budget every year for uh, as uh, capacity size and now i should also focus on emission a little bit uh, the total emission from the power sector in bangladesh is 41 million tons per year and 19.4 million to uh, tons are from adb investment power plants only so only three days earlier mr uh, executive director uh, security forces of chinese ccec company beaten up the local laborers at Rupsha 880 megawatt power plant when the laborers joined in a demand uh, for a festival bonus for upcoming Eid. Subsequently, there was a clash between Chinese and Bangladeshi workers and the uh, EPC contractor filed a case against around 450 local laborers and they are now in hide. So, you know, uh, the, what could be happened? These farmers, would have uh, their own community-based power mini grids. The government would have pay too much over capacity charges and uh, uh, could save money for uh, education and health services. Illegal land grabbing, displacement, and environmental destruction would have not been happened. The country could reduce emission of you know the, at least the 19 million uh, tons of carbon. And uh, for that reason, my uh, recommendation is. The first recommendation is ADB uh, to come out of the addiction of the fossil fuel, especially domestic fossil gas and liquid-fired uh, natural gas, uh, which is LNG. Uh, out of 500 million budget in Rupsha power plant, uh, around 393.57 million uh, dollar uh, has been disbursed already, according to, to today morning. Uh, so stop the uh, our future installment of this power plant. Uh, that is the uh, second uh, recommendation. The third recommendation is there is no financial report available uh, for Reliance Meghnagat uh, 700 megawatt power, uh, 750 megawatt power plant. Uh, it seems that the loan amount is yet to be disbursed. We strongly demand to cancel the project and withdraw the uh, USD 282 million from the, the Reliance, which is also a bankrupt. Uh, support communities, not the large uh, private companies. More tight safeguard screening and information disclosure for power sector, private sector. Support to ensure 100% renewables by 2050 for in Bangladesh and support to convert the on-way grids to a smart grid so that community can generate their own electricity and evacuate the uh, a surplus to the national grid. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mahedi. Um, Thanks for giving us the country level view as well and very real examples of the impacts of energy decisions in Bangladesh. Um, as we've come to the end of the first section, we're going to take a pause in presentations to provide uh, E.D. Fisher with five minutes to give an initial reaction to what has been presented so far by CSO colleagues um, on the ADB energy policy and specific fossil fuel based project, projects. Over to you. Thanks a lot. And you're really giving me a lot to work with. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for uh, the recommendations. And I'm really impressed by the level of analysis and, and detail you put into, into these important questions that can only help. Um, my ideas are, are those. I think uh, what your recommendations really bring out is that it's not enough to look at uh, what kind of projects should we support and what uh, kind of projects we should re refrain from. Because of the questions we tackle here are collective and they are systemic. They are collective in the sense that we can't do it, do it alone. 
in order to, to even approach success here, we need consensus with uh, the DMC or the partner government about, in the case of uh, decarbonization, uh, about a clear exit path from fossil fuels. Without this consensus, it's very hard to work um, on, on that basis, exactly because it's, it's a collective endeavor. Um, and uh, you know, one of the special things of ADB is that uh, the borrowing countries are also represented in, uh, in the board. And I think it's not too much to say that right now, uh, there is not full consensus in the board yet about how ambitious and how fast this exit path out of, uh, uh, out of fossil fuels uh, should be. We are still in discussion and you can imagine which position uh, our constituencies and myself, we are taking on this. You, uh, uh, you mentioned one of the, the strong arguments you were oneself, uh, yourself. Um, the thing is with infrastructure, especially in a, um, uh, energy infrastructure, you, the risk is to uh, become path dependent. The kind of infrastructure you build now, you will be trapped with over the next uh, uh, 30, 40 years. So we better get it right now. So much for collective. The other side, equally important, systemic. Because um, our colleague uh, uh, really made a convincing case on, on Bangladesh uh, that uh, the reforms we need and the enabling an environment we need uh, is really beyond the project. Um, and that's why I personally um, find it very, very important uh, for the energy policy to address uh, sector reform. Uh, because we need this path, we need uh, the right environment, uh, we need the right incentives uh, because we can't solve these, these issues on the project level alone. Uh, Paris alignment, uh, the issue of uh, fake solutions, uh, the, the whole debate about uh, clean coal, uh, carbon capture, storage, etc. I think that's one of the example of um, uh, things depending on the leverage uh, ADB can, can bring to the table. Uh, in my introductory remarks, uh, I noted three options to look at that, that leverage. And it's obvious, I think, uh, the, the more leverage ADB has, the more ambitious we, we can be. Um, final remark. Um, I think you addressed a very important issue, uh, which is uh, people affected by, by projects. Uh, I can only reiterate that uh, we have safeguards, we have uh, an accountability mechanism. I won't say this uh, mechanism and these safeguards are perfect. That's the reason why, uh, you know, we are revising the safeguards. But um, it's another reason uh, to not only look at the energy policy, but also on other policies of ADB as well. Thank you. Thanks very much for giving us your thoughts and we hope we can continue to give you a lot to work with um, in terms of the path out of fossil fuels. Um, and maybe we pick up on some of these issues after the second section of panel presentations. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, Titi Sointoro to speak, who's the Executive Director of AXI for Gender, Social and Ecological Justice. Her main focus is on mainstreaming women's rights and gender consideration into policies and projects related to safeguards, information disclosure, participation and accountability mechanisms of international financial institutions, climate change financing in Indonesia and the Green Climate Fund. Um, today, she's going to provide a CSO critique on ADB's policy on geothermal projects. Thanks very much, Titi. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you to NGO Forum on ADB for in the invitation to share views in regard to ADB, geothermal, Paris Goal, etc. Good afternoon, ED Fisher, and good afternoon, everyone. So in the context of Paris Agreement, we also want to address the climate crisis that affected our lives 
badly and support the commitments in Paris 2015 to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 Celsius and for the low carbon development path. However, for us, low carbon development path is not about changing types of energy source only from high carbon into the low carbon and also not about big and massive projects on the name of the low carbon. It is because the problem is not solely about the sources of energy, but also the system that controls the use of those sources, which is the capitalistic patriarchal domination of the global economic system. So we witness in our countries how the extractive high carbon development affected the people's lives and the environment. Land and resource grabbing is on the news. Air, water, and soil pollutions happen. It strengthened the patriarchal norms of oppressive governments and militarism. There is a violation of human and women's rights and further domestication of women. So we don't want to see it again if we want to achieve the goal of Paris Agreement, but we want to see a new transformative cultures, which is democratic, gender, and climate just. The existing extractive high carbon economy has also has to change its behavior and way of doing businesses to transit into the sustainable and regenerative low carbon economy. So in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, although ADB is a supporter of dominating global economies through its financing and investment in uh, developing Asia, ADB too must commit to stop financing fossil fuel. Also go to the direction of supporting the transformation into the regenerative and sustainable low carbon development by considering more the needs of the peoples rather than the greedy interests of cooperation and oppressive governments. The ADB energy policy review is one of the way to show these transformations and goodwill. The new energy policy has to show the commitment to stop financing fossil fuel and also to exclude low carbon energy sources that are environmentally and socially unsustainable. Then here I would like to speak about ADB and geothermal support in Indonesia. ADB was successfully in removing policy and institutional barrier that have hindered its support for geothermal projects in Indonesia through its technical assistance and geothermal sectoral program. So the new law allowed geothermal activities in the forest protected area when as before it is forbidden. Considering 80% of Indonesian geothermal reserve is inside the protected forest area and conservation forest. So it means through this support, ADB successfully supported the clear, clear cut of remaining Indonesian forest only for its geothermal projects. And this role, we don't want to see it again because you asked uh, E.D. Fisher, what is the role of ADB? That's one the role that we don't want to see actually. And geothermal also contain inherent capital and intensive investment. It's very expensive. Even the IFI, ADB, IFC, World Bank are reluctant to fund upfront exploration and typical will provide financing only 50% if they already see the steam. Poor GCF finance is uh, give money to the World Bank to for exploration uh, finance, which is they don't want to do it by themselves. So if it is about the debt, then the debt for the geothermal exploration and extraction is actually from our public money uh, to pay such unsustainable energy sources. So there's a lot of environmental risk 
80% of the Indonesian's uh, reserve of geothermal is in the mountainous protected areas, which is the source of waters for millions of people. Pollution from geothermal fluids, excessive water use that affect lake, spring, groundwater of the surrounding community where they need it for their daily life and for their agricultures. There is a change in land and forest use for exploration and plant construction and soil subsidence. Health issue is also there, noise and site pollution, you know. Continuously smell of rotten eggs is in the air and exposure from gas emitted from rock muffler and saline water into the community wells. There is also safety issue related, you know. Uh, Indonesian geothermal potentials are mostly adjacent to the volcanoes that's occurred many times and also recently. So geothermal drilling activity can trigger earthquake, you know, experience from Poha, Basel in Europe also show this. Earthquake can also disrupt drilling activities, you know. Uh, for example, the Siduarjo mud floors case in Indonesia. And we also see leak, leak of pipes, burst of gas recently in Sumatra and Java injured many people and many deaths. So conclusion, I will do that. Geothermal is a financial, environmentally, health and socially and safety risk energy source. So it must not be acknowledged and included as clean and affordable energy source in the ADB new energy policy. Otherwise, ADB strategy 2030 about eliminating poverty, strengthening sustainability, building resilience, and so on and so on, will stay only as an aspirational, aspirational paper. So uh, I will stop here and happy to have a further conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Titi. Um, and for reminding us that all these decisions can have a really negative impact in people's lives and that they do require significant change. Um, finally, I'm pleased to invite our last speaker, Dr. Jorge Emanuel, who will be providing a critique on ADB's promotion of waste to energy as an approach to climate mitigation and circular economy. Jorge is Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Siliman University in the Philippines. He was previously the Chief Technical Advisor for Global Environmental Facility Projects of the United Nations Development Programme in New York, where he led teams of technical experts in different countries working on waste management and developing new waste treatment technologies. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, Sophie, and uh, thank you to E.D. Robert Fisher, and thank you for the opportunity to present. As developing countries are faced with a growing problem of municipal solid waste, the world is also uh, threatened by the climate crisis. The decisions made by the ADB board will have huge implications on our decarbonization agenda. Therefore, misguided solutions to the climate, waste, and energy sector, such as energy from waste or modern thermal technologies or thermal waste to energy not be adopted in the new ADB energy policy. Next slide, please. Uh, let me begin by comparing the carbon intensity based on full CO2 emissions of thermal waste to energy in the EU 28 in 2018 with the carbon intensity of the average EU electricity grid. The carbon intensity of energy produced through thermal waste to energy was about 580 gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, or about twice the carbon intensity of the average EU electricity grid estimated at 296 gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. With progressive decarbonization of the electricity supply in the EU, thermal waste to energy will have a great adverse impact on the climate. Next slide. A recently completed study compares total CO2 emissions from thermal waste to energy with those oil-fired oil -fired and gas plants in the United States. 
The study concluded waste to energy incineration is the most emission intensive form of power generation. As the graph shows, for every unit of electricity produced, waste to energy incineration emits 1.7 times more greenhouse gases than coal-fired plants, 2.5 times more than oil-fired plants, and 4.2 times more than gas plants when accounting for both biogenic and fossil CO2. I recognize that the current can is to ignore biogenic CO2. The assumption is that biogenic carbon emissions are equivalent to carbon taken out in plant growth. Ignoring biogenic CO2 makes thermal waste to energy look better. Next slide, please. Accounting for biogenic carbon, however, is essential for several reasons. Firstly, uh, climate change is time critical, and we need, to uh, we need immediate reductions in greenhouse gases. Secondly, biogenic CO2 is emitted almost instantaneously from all waste to energy plants, yet it will take many years to decades to recapture the equivalent carbon through the growth of trees and long-lived plant species. Thirdly, ignoring biogenic CO2 assumes that the biogenic waste feedstocks were generated from sustainable forestry and agricultural practices. Sadly, the majority of wood and agricultural waste are not sustainably obtained and will not be reviewed, and the unsustainable practices will lead to long-term decline in carbon storage in forests and soil. Thus, thermal waste to energy will exacerbate our crisis and is not a climate solution. Next slide, please. ADB's uh, WTE Best Practice Handbook notes that, quote, planners need to consider how to feed the beast, unquote. And WTE beasts are, are insatiable creatures. Operating to full efficiency jeopardizes the recycling of recyclable plastic because of plastic's heating values uh, greatly desired by W operators. Feeding the beast has a lock-in effect, which a UNEP report described as, quote, the requirement of a fixed amount of waste for incineration over the plant's life, unquote. Funding WTE undermines national goals on waste prevention, reuse, and recycling, and undermines jobs and incomes from reuse, recycling, and composting. The Philippine Development Plan, for example, aims to increase the national waste diversion rate to 80% by 2022. However, technical assistance projects are pushing for WTE in partnership with the private sector, despite a standing legal ban on incinerators and its stated diversion rate. Moreover, bank specialists have recommended lifting the ban to address the country's waste problems. The put or pay contra WTE mandate municipalities to meet waste feedstock quotas or pay a fine. Next slide, please. Promoting thermal waste to energy also undermines real renewable energy solutions that derive from natural processes that do not get depleted. A study of waste incineration in the UK, for example, compared the average fossil carbon intensity of uh, UK incineration with UK's generation-based grid average, and also compared it with the life cycle carbon emissions of um, uh, real renewable resources such as uh, wind and solar. As the graph shows, low carbon renewable energy sources are far more effective options in terms of carbon reduction than thermal waste to energy. Next slide, please. Recently, the uh, EU Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance released its recommendation for the EU taxonomy, a tool to help promote the transition to a low carbon resilient and efficient economy. The Taki report excludes thermal waste to energy from economic activities considered for, quote, sustainable finance, quote, that is, activity, activities that contribute to climate change mitigation without impacting the transition to a circular economy. In effect, the consensus of the EU technical expert group, as I understand it, is that waste to energy incineration is no place in a circular economy. Next, last slide, please. 
Uh, we have been monitoring safeguard concerns in ADB waste to energy projects. In technical assistance involving Cebu in the Philippines, for instance, numerous violations on social and environmental safeguards were, were dotted, such as the absence of a complete engineering, engineering design and landfill site, lack of meaningful consultations with CS, CSOs, and the affected in a waste sector, non-recognition of community opposition and resistance, and disregard of national environmental laws. Scientific evidence has shown that thermal waste to energy hinders our collective effort in achieving the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Community world reject WTE due to its toxic emissions, such as dioxins and furans, and its enormous financial burden on public aid. But there's also no reason for adopting thermal waste to energy systems in the bank policy based on climate, time is running out. Most of Asia is still battling the uh, pandemic and metal financing is also running out. On behalf of the zero waste movement and communities affected by WTE projects of the bank, we call on ADB to divest immediately from thermal waste to energy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Dr. Jorge. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise on some of the issues associated with waste to energy um, and the reasons why the ADB should divest from thermal waste to energy. Um, we've come to the end of the second section, so I'm going to just ask um, E.D. Fisher again to provide his reaction to these last two presentations before we move on to the um, Q&A session. Thank you. Um, I want to underline uh, one, I think, a very important point the first speaker in this round made, and this is uh, that uh, the way we approach a project, the way we approach a program will always be informed um, and laden with the values we bring to the table. And uh, my sense is that uh, this important fact sometimes gets lost in, in ADB, and uh, that's why I thank you for reminding us. Uh, my experience is uh, inevitably, and as, as you would expect, different board members bring different values to the, to the table, but uh, acknowledging that uh, this is a, a value-informed, value-laden business, I think is an important thing. Uh, second, I think, uh, the things we heard just now about uh, ge geothermal projects really reinforces the question, do we have the right safeguards? And uh, I think if I look at the safeguards in other MDB and try to compare them uh, with the current safeguards of ADB, uh, I think that's another reason to, to really revise them and find where are the gaps? Uh, where can, can we improve? Um, how can, can we make sure that uh, affected people are better protected? And ideally, how uh, can we make, make sure that we really prevent damages that, uh, uh, that threaten uh, people and actually do the opposite of what uh, ADB projects are, are supposed to, to do? Um, so, Please um, also uh, remain engaged in, in the continuing discussion about our safeguards review, because just as in, in the energy debate, uh, we really need your, your input here. Just a footnote on, on the safeguards thing. Uh, you know that uh, ADB safeguards um, only apply to ADB projects, but eventually we are of course looking for systemic change that's why I think there's also a role of ADB in helping improve country systems so that not only the ADB funded projects, but other projects as well, uh, really rise up to, to that, that level. A final point on uh, waste to energy. Uh, I think uh, this also really goes beyond the energy uh, policy because uh, it also raises the question, are we doing the right thing uh, in supporting, on supporting the circular economy. 
And again, I think ADB can and uh, should improve on, on that. Uh, we have, uh, thank you for sensitizing us and, and me on, on this important point. Uh, I have a critical look at uh, this issue in the forthcoming debates on the energy policy, but I think we should also have a conversation on ways to better support the circular economy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we'll move to the Q&A session now. I feel like the spotlight's going to be very much on you, um, E.D. Fisher, in this next uh, quest set of questions. Um, the two that are at the top of the um, list, I'm going to combine them because I think um, they're kind of two sides of the same piece. Um, so the first question, while ADB has not supported any new coal finance since 2014, why does the bank still hesitate to formally announce a coal ban in 2021? And then the, the second question, um, it seems calls to shift to renewables have not gained much ground as coal plants remain the biggest source of power in the Philippines. So what are the other changes, strategies we can use to usher that change to, to pivot to renewable sources as quickly as possible? Uh, Roger, if you're able to respond to those questions. Of course, of course. Um, on the question, uh, why don't we have, why haven't we achieved a formal coal ban already? Because you uh, could really make, make the case that uh, it, it's about time and it should have happened a long time ago. Uh, the answer is, uh, as I said, I'm not the only executive director in the board. And there are, there is my view, representing 7%, and there are other views. And uh, what you see in the board and in the corridors, if I might may say so in, in these virtual times, what you see is an ongoing conversation where uh, I and uh, like-minded colleagues really make the case to achieve a consensus uh, as close as possible to where we want to go. And this is uh, being fast in achieving the Paris goals. Um, second, uh, sources of, of leverage. Uh, yes, I believe um, ADB has leverage and I believe ADB should use it uh, to make it, at least to make it easier for DMC to uh, engage in Ambition, uh, ambitious transition paths, but there are other sources of, of leverage as well. I think uh, in one important source you are engaging right now, you're making the case. You, you show uh, on a very solid scientific basis that this is the right thing to do. And I'm trying to do similar things in, in the board and you should it do, uh, do it publicly and, and elsewhere. Uh, the other thing, the other source of leverage, um, I think uh, we should not forget about that, is, uh, is support. It's one thing to, to ask uh, DMCs to do the, the right thing, and it's an entirely different story if you offer your support and say you're not alone in this uh, important and this difficult uh, task. If you're saying... Uh, I know there are different experiences, uh, success stories, and maybe there are, there's a chance to replicate that success story in another uh, country in, in the Asia and Pacific. Um, these are, I think, uh, sources of leverage, and maybe I, I forgot some. Thanks very much. Um... Moving down the questions, there's a question about how um, NGOs can collaborate with ADB um, in the revision of the energy policy um, and also towards COP26. Um, Roger, if you have any thoughts on that. Of course. 
from the um, NYP. I understand uh, there's an ongoing engagement uh, process organized by the ADB, which uh, provides opportunities for, for civil society organizations to make your case and uh, give your recommendations. Um, and uh, just be certain that I took very detailed notes about your recommendations and uh, the reasons why uh, you made that case. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, different ways to, to engage. I think you'll find them on, on the ADB website. Uh, second, yes, COP26. Uh, this is exactly the date where we really hope to, to make progress. As you know, the current or the, the forthcoming chair of COP26 is the UK, a country which I represent. But I think um, in uh, COP26 matters, it's better to engage directly with uh, UK authorities. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the panel who'd like to respond to that question? If so, raise your hand. Okay. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, how can youth get more involved in pushing for an energy policy that meets the Paris goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius? What action steps can we take? Um, I'd like to direct that to Roger Fisher, but also to some of our CSO colleagues who are also um, kind of organizing around the energy policy. Um, is there anyone who'd like to start, if you could raise your hand? Um, uh, Mahedi or Titi, would you have any thoughts on, on that? question yep. <laughs> thank you uh, for the question uh, in in Bangladesh uh, in India in different countries like Philippines and uh, Indonesia and other countries also the NG forum and EDB members uh, uh, are active and uh, they have uh, you know communication with the youth groups in the country so if you want to join uh, the uh, campaign on uh, adb's energy policy uh, you can join with any of these uh, groups uh, in in your country uh, including bangladesh you know thanks very much um Titi, I know you struggled to hear the question. Um, if you're able to answer, it's in the chat box. So what was the question? Uh, how, how youth can also get involved in the campaign on the energy policy? So right now, now, Indonesia, the government is developing a bill on low carbon economy. So, therefore, we are when we focus on the on the energy issue because the low carbon economy is heavily on the energy uh, issue. Then we call for like before. It's like changing the natures of how to do business in Indonesia related to energy. Because it is not, if we want to shift from high carbon to low carbon, it is not only about projects, but you know, it's about the whole system, how we can create system that is democratic, climate and gender just. So that is one of our uh, advocacy focus right now in Indonesia. And also, we join um, the safeguard review, the energy policy review of uh, ADB. So that's uh, what we are doing right now related on that. I think I respond to your question, no? Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, Roger, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything. Go ahead. Just uh, my, my, my two cents. Uh... In a way, the question surprises me because my experience is uh, youth is very, very savvy in 
putting together effective campaigns, especially using digital media. But uh, I would uh, I would say this. I think uh, I would recommend everyone in in CSOs, not uh, not just youth, to do exactly what what you do now, uh, to make the case and base it on on a solid basis on of, of facts and scientific research to make concrete actionable recommendations you can really work with. This is, uh, in my experience, much more uh, effective than just being abstract. Um, then, and this is outside the, the ADB cosmos, I remember in my previous job, I was uh, working in G20 business. And I remember there is uh, the, the engagement group uh, Y20 that makes it possible for you to engage in, uh, in G20 matters for youth. Uh, the idea is that uh, in every G20 member country, uh, there is an organization and all those are youth organization and all youth organizations from G20 countries come together and together develop recommendations for G20 leaders to consider. I think that's, that's an effective uh, venue as well. Thank you. And also, I think I'd be missing an opportunity if I didn't say that um, anyone who's interested in working on this is welcome to join us in the Fossil Free ADB um, campaign. Um, too. Um, I think we have time for one final question. Um, there's many more questions on the list, um, and I think we can take a note of them and um, try to uh, forward them to the relevant people at the ADB. Um, the last question at the top of the list says, in um, Karek region, countries are rich in hydrocarbons. Um, and in the post-pandemic period, this share in hydrocarbons will most probably increase. Are there any plans to support renewables in the Karek region? Is there anyone who'd like to respond to that question? You could raise your hand, please. Oh, OK, well, I think um, that's a question we can take away as well um, and submit to the relevant people. Um, I think uh, I'd like to hand back to uh, Roger Fisher for any closing remarks before we end today. Um, and also perhaps in that to include what we as CSOs can can expect in the rest of the process of reviewing the ADB energy policy and if you have any specific re recommendations of, of what else we can do and any other closing remarks that you might have. In a way, um, what I say now cannot be closing remarks because uh, this is an ongoing process. Um, one of the things we have discussed is uh, the things we want to see, um, you and, and I as well, uh, really go beyond the energy policy. So one mark on the way will be the finalization of the uh, new energy policy for the ADB. Uh, which, as I said, uh, I hope will be finalized in time before COP26. But then we also need to talk about uh, the safeguards. We need to talk about circular economy and, and different issues. Uh, because, as you know, one of the complex issues or things in development is everything is connected. And it's very hard to isolate uh, development issues to, to one sector or one one policy. So uh, my reminder would be, please continue looking beyond the energy policy. Um, on the way forward, uh, your recommendations are, are really duly noted. I can't speak for the entire ADB, but uh, I can guarantee you that I will consider, I do consider them, there's no doubt. Um, if you want to come up with additional ideas or recommendations, uh, ADB is always open to, uh, to receiving them and, and considering them. And as I said, uh, this will be uh, a consensus building process. 
And uh, building consensus, in my experience, means uh, you normally don't end up uh, where you ideally would want to be, but somewhere below. How far below expectations we will end up, I just don't know. Uh, what I know is that I and a number of like-minded executive directors will do whatever we can uh, to raise the bar, uh, to increase the level of ambition, and to make sure uh, that ADB really rises to, to the challenge, especially of uh, climate change. Uh, this I, I can tell you, this I can guarantee you. Again, I can't guarantee you um, any specific outcome. Thanks very much for your thoughts and um, all of your uh, responses today. Um, I think we would agree that um, this does go beyond the energy policy, but um, many of the key demands around uh, ending finance to fossil fuels and increasing investment in renewable energy um, can be included in the energy policy. And now is the opportunity for, for um, the ADB to step up on these changes. Um, in t as I mentioned before, in terms of all the other questions, we'll take note of them and take them away. I'd like to express thanks um, to E.D. Fisher and all of the panellists here today for your um, really great presentations um, and responses. And thanks as well to NGO Forum on ADB for organising this event. And of course, to everyone joining us in, the, in this session and watching the live stream. I think it's fair to say there's a lot of interest and expectation around the energy policy review and how it can continue to accelerating action on climate change in the region. Um, and we're all very keen to continue to engage with this process as much as possible. Um, so hopefully this conversation can continue um, and we can continue to engage with the bank. Um, once again, thanks everyone. Um, Stay safe and have a great day, evening, wherever you are. Um, and goodbye Thank from you me too. and goodbye from all the panel here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Edie Fisher Thank you. and Thank others. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Edie Fisher. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everyone.